What's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Jeteris here, a.k.a. the Tratocaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. This time, we're previewing the New York Knicks facing the Sacramento Kings. They'll be in Sacktown at the Golden One Center at 10 p.m. on Thursday night on TNT. And with me today to preview this game is James Ham, Kings insider for ESPN 1320. And he's also a credential member providing coverage for the Kingsbeat.com. But before we get into asking James how he's doing today and this, this breakdown, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. And remember that this show is sponsored by KnicksFanTV.com. James, my guy, how are you doing today? Good. Yeah, I can't imagine having to stay up until 10 o'clock to watch a game. <laughs> You know, I, you said that I was like, oh, man, that's true. Wow. Like seven o'clock starts are bad because uh, they're you're there super late. But yeah, 10 o'clock start. That that's brutal. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we do watch along stuff like that. And so in the past, uh, before we had J.D., who's doing a killer job with these play uh, play by plays, we used to do watch alongs, then have to do the post game afterwards. So we'd be there for like three to four hours. And, you know, it it's a true test to Knicks fan TV's uh, dedication to covering this team. All right. Commitment but to the craft. Of course, <laughs> of course, of course, of course. But James, we're here today to break down this game. And we're here for you to get that insider knowledge on the Sacramento Kings. And let me start off with this question. What have your thoughts been on the season overall? Uh, it's crazy. Um, I was telling you before we, we came on the air here. Um, I've covered this team for the last 13 years as a credentialed media member. I came into this season and uh, someone had done my win loss record and it was like 240 games under 500. Uh, I've saw, I've seen a lot of bas bad basketball, um, a ton of bad basketball. I've seen two full relocation attempts. Uh, mm. I have three or four GMs. Um, I'm on my ninth head coach. Uh, so, so I've seen uh, a lot. I, I'm uh, a grizzled vet. Uh, a little bit embattled here and uh you know to be honest this has been just a breath of fresh air uh mike brown has just been spectacular uh he's changed the culture of the team and uh what they've been able to do i think every step of the way it's surprising like i i did not expect to cover a team that with 18 games remaining in the season would be tied uh with tiebreakers uh, with the memphis grizzlies for the number two seed in the western conference um i just didn't see it coming I thought they would be better. I thought they would fight for the play-in spot. Uh, my my sort of height that I thought they would be would maybe six through ten in the Western Conference, but to see them where they are now is just stunning. And uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been a good season. Absolutely, you know, it's the same on this side for the New York Knicks because even myself, I have predicted this team to get forty-two wins to be slightly above five hundred just because of what we saw last season that underachieved after a year of making the playoffs as the four seed, you know, you had Kemba Walker, Evan Fournier last year. It just was clunky. And then starting the season, you know, we didn't know wh what Julius Randle were going to get this season. Now he's back to playing at an all NBA level, all-star, you know, adding Jalen Brunson. I knew he would be impactful and helpful for this team, but he's been playing like an all-star and quite honestly was snubbed, but he should also be, in my opinion, considered for, uh, you know, all NBA as well, even though at the guard position, it's very heavy, but that's how good he's been for the Knicks this season. So for a team that, you know, I was thinking around six to probably more likely in the plan right now, they're in fifth, they're battling, they're competing with the cat. Everyone's had in rumors like, Oh, the Donovan Mitchell trade should have got through blah, 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 all this. So it's, it's been a breath of fresh air once again for the Knicks, just like your Kings. And let me ask you this. What have your thoughts been? been about the Knicks season so far because this is going to be the second time the the Knicks are playing the Kings so what do you think <laughs> yeah I mean they're a bad matchup for the Kings uh especially if Brunson plays um Brunson has always torn up the Kings he's physical he gets to the paint uh the Kings aren't great at keeping people out of the paint um and I I really do like his game against the Kings um you know Randall has been a guy that's just demolished the Kings too uh, I don't know how many times he's broke the 40 point barrier against the Kings, but it feels like he's probably the leading scorer against this team over the last like five years. Uh, just again, a tough matchup. The Kings don't have a guy like him. Uh, we'll see a lot of like Harrison Barnes playing him, maybe some Keegan Murray, uh, but he's a difficult matchup. Uh, so I've been impressed, you know, they're physical and that's a good thing. Uh, I, I really like Emmanuel quickly. I had been, uh, like sort of 
a scout friend had said, Hey, you need to watch mm-hmm. Emmanuel quickly coming into the draft uh, the year he came out. And um, he expected him to go early second round where the Kings had to pick. And of course he went a little higher than that. And uh, just really a like strong, again, a tough matchup. Like he's, he's physical, he's long. He can defend uh, a guy like De'Aaron Fox. He, he doesn't have the quickness that, that Fox does, but he certainly has a physicality. Uh, so really, you know, I, I like the Knicks construction. I, I did not think Tom Thibodeau would be the guy that kept, you know, leading this team, but it seems like he's figured out a way to connect with his, his players again and, and really get them back on the right path. And he's the guy a little bit like Mike Brown who's really hard on his players and, you know, who, who really demands a lot. And, uh, it sometimes that wears, wears thin on, on players. Uh, but it seems like he's figured out a way to recapture the imagination of his team, which again, I did not think would happen. I thought Thibodeau would be out and you'd be looking at someone else, uh, this season. So yeah, it's an interesting group of, of players, you know, RJ Barrett's talented. Uh, they've got, they've got scores. They've got, uh, length um, that the Kings don't have. Uh, but, you know, we'll see how it goes. You know, they just rattle off nine straight. That's big. I did not expect them to lose to the Cavs. I expected them to roll into Sacramento a 10 game win streak. And mm. then we'd have to kind of see how, you know, it played out. And, uh, you know, no, they lost to the, the Hornets. Sorry. My bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, I expected them to roll in with the 10 game win streak and, and it to be a, a battle. They're they're going to be in for it though. Like the Golden One Center crowd is is like second to none. It's absolutely incredible. Sellouts every night, but like fully engaged, chanting. You'll hear it through your TVs at like one o'clock in the morning when the game's going. Uh, <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll be like, that. I've got to be up until one a.m. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that's right. You'll be like, wow, that's really loud. Uh, I wish it wasn't eleven thirty. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but yeah, you know, I thought we. There's expectation that Tom would have, Tom Thibodeau would have been out earlier this season too. I mean, we had a recent uh, article dropped yesterday by your own Weissman uh, for Fox, and even Tibbs himself thought he was going to be fired during that stretch. But sticking on pace with the, this matchup and the Kings, you mentioned Randall. You know, you're going to have Keegan Murray guarding him, probably Harrison Barnes. You didn't mention Demontis Sabonis, which is interesting because that's a guy that. Randall seems to just like he always rises up to the challenge against Sabonis, especially when Sabonis was out in Indiana. And I have to get your thoughts on the Tyrese Halliburton trade that included Buddy Heald and Tristan Thompson for DeMontis Sabonis, Jeremy Lamb, Justin Holiday. What were your thoughts about the trade when it, when it happened? You know, like, look, I, I've covered this team forever, and you could see that that Halliburton is really, really gifted and that he's going to be a, a really good player. Even, you know, his rookie season averaging like 12 and a half points, his second season. I mean, the problem that you had was that, like, him and Fox just, it, they were good friends. They wanted to work together. It just didn't work. And so I was surprised when it happened. I was I was literally told by someone in the front office like two days before that they were going to build around Fox and Halliburton and move forward with that. And then when the the deal hit, it was stunning. Um, and on top of that, like if you you guys, I'm sure everyone out there has seen an interview with Tyrese Halliburton. He's a joy to cover. Like there there aren't like there might be two or three other players in the league that have his ability to talk to the media and to just like lay it all out there and to be honest forthright, just one of the best quotes you're ever going to run into. It's like him and CJ McCollum. They, they just have this way about them uh, of speaking and, and, you know, kind of taking on whatever, whatever's happening. And uh, I thought Ty was just, again, we talk about a breath of fresh air. He was just like spectacular to cover. Um, And so when it happened, the initial thing was shock, right? But once you you kind of wrapped your head around it, the Kings got a 25-year-old two-time all-star center who's one of the best passers in the league outside of Jokic. It's him and Jokic at the at the center position. And what they've been able to do to create an offense around him is just stunning. I, I mean, so the deal at first was like again, it was jarring, but I liked it, even in the beginning, because you know, the Kings weren't winning with Tyrese Halliburton. You know, they 
the team that season, they really liked Luke Walton. They they talked about it all the time. They they wanted to win for Luke Walton. They couldn't win. And I mean, there were games they got drubbed by 40. And we asked Halliburton one game, you know, how bad does this feel to lose by this? He goes, Oh no, this isn't the worst game I've ever played. And that was last season when we lost by 45. <laughs> and so you started to get this understanding that, you know, some of these you had to do something different. And Monty McNair, Wes Wilcox, they swung for the fences. They put it all out there because Sabonis is only under contract for this year and next. Uh, but, I mean, talk about hitting a home run. This team has been um, out of the playoffs for for 16 straight seasons. They haven't had an identity. They haven't had any sort of, like, positive momentum. And this is not only a, a premium citizen in the NBA – like uh, he is Sabonis is just a really, really good guy. Uh, he's a hard worker. He's a guy who brings his hard hat to work every single day. And I think it's, it's funny. You, you look at around the league, it's stat lines and we're in a day, like an era where there are some crazy stat lines out there. I mean, the fact that Jokic is averaging a triple double, uh, you know, that we're seeing, you know, so many guys over 30 points a game, but to watch a player come in each and every day, and no, I mean, you can write it in with pen that he's going to have 18 points, 13 rebounds, and six and a half, seven assists every single game. And it doesn't matter if he's in foul trouble. It it just doesn't matter. He's just a workhorse. And I don't think, you know, whether he's a, a superstar or not, we're talking about a guy who, like, if we look at baseball terms, he's like a, a number two starter on – on a hundred win team. Like he's a, a workhorse. He's a guy that you hand the ball to every single night. He directs traffic. And so while I, I, it's very rare, this happens in the NBA, the team worked out for both for both uh, franchises. And uh, I, I'm really excited to see uh, Sabonis and Fox and, and the rest of the guys develop this chemistry. So it was a stunning move when it happened. Uh, but it's worked out really well. And, and I was ex like excited to see this play out when it happened. I wasn't one of the people who were like, oh, this is the worst trade ever. Um, because I, I sat here and watched it not work. And, a, you know, another mm -hmm. head coach get fired midseason. And it wasn't working. And so this is what had to happen. Um, it was either Fox or Halliburton. And clearly at this point, it looks like they, they chose the right path. Uh, Ty would probably be an all-star in the Western conference without, uh, without Fox, um, just like he is in the Eastern conference. But by trading for Sabonis, you got two all-stars and that's yeah. it. You know, it worked absolutely. out. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I was even a little confused with the whole guard pairing. Cause you had Fox, you had Hal Burton, you also had Davion Mitchell that was selected. I'm like, how is this all going to work out? And you look at that trade now, and like you said, you got two all-stars. They made it the season. Fox was a starter. You had some bonus as a reserve. And, you know, that's why this match is also kind of interesting because, oh, man, I really wish that Brunson made the all-star because he was so deserving. But it's really, you look at, it's Fox and Sabonis against, hopefully Brunson's healthy for this game. Brunson and Randall, I feel like that would be a fun matchup to watch because it's two positions or, well, Sabonis is playing center, but you got two bigs. And, and your point guard's going at it, it'll be a fun matchup. But you mentioned Mike Brown having some of that Tom Thibodeau-likeness where it comes to it can really rub rub off on players the wrong way because of how hard he pushes them. Give me a little details about Mike Brown and, and the selection of him as a head coach and what he's done for this team this season. Yeah, so like as, as far as a – Mike is a player's coach, right? So he is a guy that – that everyone loves. Um, but he's also, um, you know, he's very meticulous. Uh, OCD is, is how he's described by a lot of people. Mm. He wants excellence. He wants focus. Um, and, and again, I've covered this team forever. I've never had a coach practice as much. Like the Kings had a seven game road trip. They got off the plane at two o'clock in the morning and they practice the next day. Like I've mm. never seen a coach that practices so much. And at first I was like, okay, this is going to wear on the guys. And you can look at some of the players during the season and see these dips in performance, right? Malik Monk from like, uh, like the second week of December until late January, there's like a 24 game stretch where he shot 
like 36% from the field and 25% from three. And I, I felt like he was worn out. And we've seen Kevin Herter have these big dips. We've seen Fox had a small dip in, in productivity. Sabonis really hasn't, except for the first couple of games of the season where he fouled out every single night. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, sort of Harrison Barnes right there too. I'm going to pull like Keegan Murray and kind of put him to the side because Keegan is a rookie and, you know, you have your rookie wall that you hit like three times during a season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so he's had ups and downs, but, uh, but the core group of these guys, you, you've seen them like sort of wear out. And now we get to this point in the season with 18 games left. And I feel like the Kings, uh, number one, they've been one of the healthiest teams in the league. Um, and part of that is because, like they've had two pretty substantial injuries that uh, with Sabonis having an avulsion fracture in his thumb and Keegan Murray having something similar that wasn't quite an avulsion fracture, but something wrong inside the thumb where he wore a brace for like eight weeks. They've played through it. And uh, I actually, at this point, I want to give props to Mike Brown because I, I think a lot of what's happened here is his players are just in great shape. You know, they are game ready every single night and i think a lot of the league is doing this whole load management thing and they're sitting players or resting players like whatever happened to the days of latrell spreewell playing 82 games a year and 42 oh, minutes man. a night like it's it's gone and those players were in great shape because they practice hard they played every night and so that's where i kind of look at this kings team they're doing something a little old school as far as like practice and, and playing and the amount of minutes, but I think it's working. And uh, Mike Brown, um, you know, he's known as a defensive coach. The Kings are, are horrific defensively and it mm. kills Mike Brown. It like hurts his soul. You can see it every night, but they are historically good offensively. Like they have the greatest offense in the history of the NBA. As of right now, if you look at offensive rating and over their last 12 games, I mean, they're averaging almost 131 points a night. Like this, it, their offensive rating is like 118.8. And oh. it, it's it's absolutely wild to watch this team work. And it's really like the basis is Fox and Sabonis. You know, you're using Fox's speed, his ability to get downhill. You're seeing like in the, the change in direction, the change in speed that he can do. It's absolutely amazing. But I'd say the key to the, the Halliburton and Sabonis trade was – you got two interesting pieces in Sabonis and Fox that are very different, but they're really, really easy to put other players around. So if you look at a guy like Luka Doncic or James mm -hmm. Harden or, you know, name that guy who has a high usage uh, that likes to dribble the ball, like it's not easy to put players around those guys. And that's mm -hmm. why those guys aren't winning, you know, 55, 60 games a year, even though they should. Uh, maybe Harden will with Embiid, but... Um, but you know, again, Luca, it, he's difficult to put a player players around and, you know, these two here, it, it's just worked and I'll give Mike Brown a lot of credit to just give in and say, okay, we're just going to have to be great offensively and, and we'll figure out the defense. We'll figure out how to get stops to get fourth quarter stops. Um, this team is battle tested. They, I think they're five and zero oh in one point games. They're four and oh or five and zero. Oh. In overtime games, they had the the double overtime win over the Clippers where they won 176 to 175, one of the greatest games you'll ever watch. Just so much fun. Mm. It, it just incredible shot making. But again, it, uh, I, I think a lot of it is Mike Brown keeping the positivity, keeping the team on the same path, uh, never too high, never too low. The Kings haven't had a three-game losing streak since November. Wow. Yeah, so like when we're if you go through every single one, it's Denver and it's the Kings. Every other two, if you look at Memphis, if you look at, uh, you know, the Suns, the Warriors, the Timberwolves, the Pelicans, all of them have had prolonged losing streaks this year, which is why mm -hmm. the Western Conference is so far down. Uh, but Mike Brown has buy-in. He's got these guys bought in, and I mean, look, again, this is my 13th season. They're one win away from matching the the highest win total I've ever seen, which is 39 wins. And and we still have 18 games to go. They're in uncharted waters. A lot of these players haven't played in the playoffs or a guy like Harrison Barnes played in the playoffs like a decade ago, you know, but Sabonis has, has limited playoff experience. Fox has never been there. 
Herter has a little bit from Atlanta, but Malik Monk has never been there. Davion Mitchell has never been there. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how he holds his team together and continues to demand uh, that they they stay together, but that they work hard and and they show up every day and they learn and they they try to get better. So before we get into the preview then, how what is the expectation then for this Kings team in the playoffs? Is it just, hey, we made it there because we haven't been there in so long, you know, from the days of like having uh, Chris Weber, B- Mike Bibby on that team, and you're like, look, we're, we're back here, so let's just be happy that we're back here. Or are you expecting to to go on like a mini run? You're expecting some like a seven-game series in the first round? Like, what is the expectation for this team then? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Uh, it was about two weeks ago. We were coming out of the All-Star break, so whatever that is, uh, all these days run in together. Um, but Harrison Barnes said, yeah, you know, we're we're kind of focused on, you know, uh, like, you know, getting getting to the, the – th- they were at the three spot there. They're like, we're, we're kind of excited about hosting a playoff series. And I said, did you just say host a playoff series? And he smiled. He goes, I did just say host a playoff series. Um, <laughs> I think the the Kings uh, don't. They're laughing at the national narrative that they're they're just going to be one and done, that they're just walking in. Their expectations is that they're going to play their brand of basketball, and they're going to go as far as they can go. And whatever that is, whether it's a a first round win, whether it's uh, getting bounced but learning something in the first round, I don't think that they care. Uh, they they are focused on one game at a time and on getting better. And uh, I'll even like they just moved into the two seed and they're they're tied with uh, Memphis. Like we heard all this, uh, the Brian Windhorse noise last week about how the Lakers couldn't wait to get there. They're, they're going to try to fight to get up to the six seed so they could play the Kings in the first round. It's like, mm-hmm. OK, man, we'll meet you in Temecula. <laughs> like, well, how about how about we make it easy for you? We'll go to two, and you can get to seven. That's that's what it feels like. This team's like, all right, bring it on, bring it on, LeBron, bring it on, AD. Like, they don't care. They're ready to play every night. And it again, there are so many wins this season where you walk into the night thinking, okay, well, this is gonna be a tough one, and then you you get done, and you're like, all right, still still standing after uh, you know, sixty four games, still standing. We are talking with James Ham, Kings insider for ESPN 1320. He also covers the Sacramento Kings as a credentialed media member for the Kings beat. So James, let's get into this game preview now. You know, for this game, there's one matchup I'm looking at. And I, and I mentioned it at the beginning of the show. It's Julius Randle versus DeMontis Sabonis because Julius Randle always shows up when he see when he sees the bonus on the other side, it's like a it's like a bull seeing red. That that's just who it's who he always wants to stand up with. I don't know if it was because at the time he was uh, as an Indiana Pacer and there was the competition of is it going to be Sabonis? Is it going to be Randall? Who's going to be that All Star two seasons ago? But Randall always shows up, and Randall has been awesome this season. He's been back to playing like the old way. He's even shooting more threes this season than that was just that's just been a shock. But his overall play is understanding the double team, recognizing the double teams, right? It's his ability to bring the ball up and just letting Jalen Brunson get him into the right position. Instead of watching Randall try to back down from three, Brunson's finding him on the block or midway through, and then Randall is able to attack the paint, finish strong, knock down his mid-range jumper, whatever it is. He's just scoring at will for most of the most of the time. Last night was an off night for him, but he was tired, all right? He had to do some work against the the, the Boston Celtics, so we can forgive him for that. But I'm looking at DeMontis Sabonis. You talked about it. He's a playmaker, too, in his own right. You talked about how he's just like Jokic when it comes to being one of the best passing bigs in the NBA. But he can also score. So I'm looking at these two guys to, to lead the matchup. What are your thoughts about these two guys being the, the, the main matchup? And are there any other ga- matchups that you're looking for in this game? Yeah, okay. So I agree with you as far as the matchup. It, it's really crazy how these two will go at it. Um you know, whether they play against each other a ton, we'll have to wait and see. Um, the Kings do like to do uh, other things. So, like, we'll probably see Keegan Murray. We'll probably see, um, you know, Harrison Barnes. Uh, just to keep Sabonis out of foul trouble. That's the biggest issue Sabonis has had all season is, is mm-hmm. foul trouble. It's the only way that you can kind of slow him down. You mm-hmm. put up the stats. I mean, the guy's shooting 63% from the field. 
uh, whatever he was in Indiana, he the numbers look very similar. They're not though. Like his efficiency, the way that he handles his business, is absolutely crazy to watch. Uh, that and and I'll bring up that uh, here's I, I think where if the Knicks want to slow down the Kings, which is almost impossible to do with the way the Kings are scoring right now, um, it's about the DHO. So a lot of teams run pick and rolls where the guard is orchestrating everything, right? And it's what you you guys are used to seeing with Brunson and and, uh, and Julius Randle. So you'll see so much of the pick and roll action be uh, the guard handling and and coming off of screens and then either kicking or, or going to the rim or pulling back, whatever it might be. The Kings run DHOs all day long, which uh, the dribble handoff. And so basically they're inverting the pick and roll. So now Sabonis is making all the decisions and the guards are playing off of him. It's really interesting to watch and it's really interesting. It's really difficult to defend. Uh, you surround Fox and and Sabonis with all these shooters, um, even like a guy like Trey Lyles. You'll see Trey Lyles defend, uh, go out and do uh, work on Julius Randle as well. Trey Lyles is shooting like 37% from three. Uh, Harrison Barnes is up to 38%. Uh, Kevin Herter is over 40, 41% from uh, uh, Keegan Murray. So basically, I, I think this matchup is, it's a lot of fun, but it's because you know, Sabonis is the great like generator of the offense. And if uh, Julius Randle doesn't eat the space and really, or if they don't throw double teams or traps at, at Sabonis, he's just going to tear him apart. And I say that because, I mean, again, the Kings are a historically good offense. That's what we're seeing. They don't, you're not going to be able to, you'll be able to score whatever you want on them, but it's whether you can outscore them. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times you can't. So I think it's a great matchup. It's a fun matchup. I hope they don't get in foul trouble. I haven't looked to see who's officiating the game. I hope like we don't get like a Scott Foster. Or, I was about to say, I hope it's not Scott Foster who's going to be like, hey, I'm going to make this a show about me and not the game. Um, yeah, yeah, that's always a bad one. And then Tony Brown uh, yeah. is, is another one where you're just like, come on, man. What are you yeah. doing? What are you watching? Like, what is happening? These are This is supposed to be about the players. I mean, even in the... The 176, 175 game uh <laughs> against the Clippers, like Sabonis sat for a huge portion of the game with five fouls. Crazy. And they were ticky tack. You're like, come on, man. Like this is this is basketball at its greatest. Like, get out of the way. Let them have a good time. So I hope yeah. that that's what we get to see. Uh, because these are two physical, like you like, you don't put you don't put Mitchell uh Robinson on, on Demonis Sabonis and think that that's gonna work. Any skinny guy. He just goes right through him. He he pushes him under the basket and dunks on him. Uh, and that doesn't it doesn't matter who it is. It's what he's done all season long. You put the big, thick guys on him, and that's the way you slow down uh, Sabonis. Yeah, and I'm I'm more curious to see how, from an offensive standpoint for the Knicks, I'm curious to see if because what the Knicks like to do is to get the switch right. And so if you're going to bring the switch on to Julius Randle, who's now capable of driving the lane finishing around the rim or just getting to his mid-range spot. If you put Sabonis on him, Randall, as I mentioned earlier, is a good three-point shooter. He's shooting currently 35% from downtown on eight attempts per game. So Randall is now a bit able to stretch the floor. If you bring Sabonis out there, you're kind of giving Randall the opportunity to say, all right, this is my chance to go drive and attack the lane. Or you're just trying to figure out that mismatch if you want to get to Brunson too. That's the other that's the other alternative that I see is because I think Sabonis has a little difficulty guarding smaller guards as well, especially who are craftier physical. That's just my opinion. Um you want me to Yeah, that's that the other matchup. That's the other yeah. matchup. It's Brunson and Fox because yeah. uh like those guys have gone at it. Like he he killed the Kings uh when he was with Dallas. And and so it's the physicality that he brings that you know he can get to the key. And it's really going to be like two different styles, you know, like the physical guys that you have, whether it's quickly or it's Brunson uh, against the flat out speed and athleticism of Fox and Monk. Um, those are really, really fun matchups. Like, and, and I think that's where it's, it'll be won and lost. I think both of the big guys are going to do their thing. Sabonis won't put up 40 like Randall will, and the Kings can't stop Randall from scoring 40. It seems like throughout historically throughout his career, uh, mm -hmm. I'd also like Fox, uh, he missed the game on, what was it, Monday, 
Uh, but it, it's a minor hamstring thing. The team was just being precautionary, you know, like super cautious with him. Um, and so I expect Fox to be back uh, and well rested. He'll have like four or five days off at that point. Um, and so you'll get like a full dose of what De'Aaron Fox is this season. And it, to be honest, it's, it's really impressive. He just uh, last game, he had 25 points. That was the first game and he had eight straight with 30 or more uh, mm. before that. Uh, he's, he's worked his way into the conversation. Like what you talked about all NBA uh, player, um, like, do I think that the Kings will get two all NBA players? Probably not. Uh, but Fox is deserving. I think he's 13th in the league in scoring. It's averaging 25 and a half a game. Um, he's just been spectacular. His fourth quarter numbers, he's the best in the league. He's the best clutch player in the league right now. Um, I don't even think it's remotely close. And a lot of the reasons why the Kings are where they are is because Fox is finishing in the fourth. Absolutely. And the, but the one guy that I have to worry about, and it was a it was a low-key smart move for the Kings, was getting one uh Kevin Herter, because Kevin Herter is a, f- a flamethrower from downtown. He's shooting 40%, close to seven attempts per game. And the Knicks have they've improved on their three-point defense, but that's a guy that I, I will be worried about in that starting rotation and seeing if, you know, whether I hopefully it's Grimes who's going to be defending him to see if he can slow him down. And even when Josh Hart's out there to make sure that he doesn't go off for for a big night um and yeah i'm curious to see how De'Aaron fox plays because he didn't play against the knicks the first time so hopefully he's back because i'd like to see what both teams look and hopefully brunts is back too because i'd like to see a full health two full healthy squads uh battling it out but going to the battle of the benches man you know knicks knicks bench is finally getting back to where it was especially with the addition of josh hart uh over the last 10 games the knicks bench is is 17th in the league when it comes to points per game with uh was it with uh 33.8 points but the kings are better as since they're 11th in the league in the last 10 games with 36.6 points coming off the bench what are your thoughts about this bench matchup because for the knicks this is where you know hopefully i think it'll be interesting it'll be an interesting test because quickly has been playing well josh hart's been playing well i'm confident but I think the Kings are also deep because you got Malik Monk, you got Davion Mitchell. This is no bench to to scoff at. So what what are your thoughts on this matchup? Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. I mean, again, look at the Kings points uh, per game there off the bench. It, that's it's inflated because the Kings just don't play defense, and their bench has to actually score thirty six and a half, or or they're going to lose. Um, that's just kind of the way it goes. Uh, the assist number is huge. Malik Monk, it really does come down to whether Malik Monk is on or not. Him and Herter kind of take turns being great in games. Uh, over his last four games, Herter's averaging uh, 23 points, four and a half assists, 2.3 rebounds. Um, but he's shooting 63% from the, from the field and 58.6% from three. Like this dude is on a tear right now. And while that's happening, Malik is kind of taking a step back. Now, this is a Knicks. They know the Kings don't get TNT games. And all of a sudden they're on TNT. So this is going to be like big lights, the 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 glamour, the glitz. And I expect a, a guy like Malik Monk, who loves the spotlight, to come out and play really, really well. So uh, D- uh, Mitchell has been great defensively. Um, he's a bear, although I don't know that he can stop quickly because quickly is just so big. Um, you know, Davion's not that big of a, uh, of a, of a guard. Um, I expect, uh, Malik to come out and really play well. And then I, I say this all the time and, and people can think I'm crazy or not, but there's been probably eight to 10 games where the Kings would have lost if it wasn't for Trey Lyles and Trey Lyles is a sneaky, sneaky, really good NBA player. And he does everything well. He shoots a three ball. He's a very good rebounder. He can score in the post. Um, he's he's not horrible defensively. He can he makes smart decisions. And you'll see him out there. You'll be like, this dude's better than I thought he was. And I, I think that's sort of the theme of the season that hmm. a guy like Trey steps up. A guy like Terrence Davis can come in. And if he hits his first couple of shots, just know you're in for a long night. Because if that guy gets hot, He's so difficult to stop, and he's another guy that really likes the the big lights. Uh, so, yeah, it should be fun. Uh, the Kings bench, they can be exciting. Chemezi Metu is doing a solid job uh, at the the backup five position. Um, and, but Mike's been keeping it pretty tight with, like, uh, 
eight, eight and a half man rotation uh, through the most of the second half. Uh, Kessler Edwards made an appearance the other night and did really well. We haven't really seen him all that much here in Sacramento, but uh, the Kings don't have that long athletic uh, three, four combo guy and Kessler's kind of figuring out if he can earn his way into the the rotation. Uh, Yeah, but it should be, it should be a fun night. It should be. I'm going to be interested to see who guards who, whether it's Josh Hart on Malik Monk or, or Mitchell or quickly uh, on, on Monk or Mitchell as well, because you're thinking about speed, you think about shooting, scoring, and whatnot. So I'll be interested to see where that goes. But let's see if the Kings are able to handle handle the the those two guards' physicality because quickly's yeah. put on weight. He's able to attack the lane, finish around the rim now. And then Josh Hart, talk about the the iconic Tom Thibodeau player, plays gritty defense, one man band man out in transition. That those are going to be two interesting matchups uh, to pay attention to pay attention to. But before I ask you the final score, just quick, I need a quick hitter because this is my guy. What happened to Rashawn Holmes? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I really like Rashawn. He uh, he had the like the eye issues last year. Uh, mm-hmm. He had two lacerations of the eye, uh, one which required stitches early in the season. Then he got COVID. Everything just kept happening that was not good. He had the offseason, uh, you know, issues with um, a custody battle um, that really, mm-hmm. like uh, – you know, words like domestic violence and child abuse and things like that were put into court documents, which mm. was not fun for him or anyone else. Uh, he's since been cleared of all that stuff. He has custody of his son. Um, you know, he's he's a good guy. Uh, but midway through the season, the Kings had to make a move to go get Demonis Sabonis. And it just buried Rashawn on the bench. And unfortunately for him, like what you talked about, the Kings do like to switch one through five. And Rich just isn't a guy that can switch one through five. He's gotcha. a guy that they can definitely defend threes and I mean fours and fives. Uh, but Shemezi Metu gives you more versatility on the defensive end. And uh, again, I, I I like Rich and I like his flip shot. And he was really good for the Kings and he got paid. Uh, and now you know basically the Kings have uh, like another twenty five million over the next two seasons. For a guy who's not playing at all, he's got a player option for the final year, like twelve and a half million. But there's no way he's opting out. Um, yeah, just uh, like as much as him coming to Sacramento was the right player at the right time to find a niche and expand and grow and become something that he wasn't before. Uh, he kind of has the tables turned on him on uh, now, where he's just the wrong player in the right in the wrong spot. Wow. Uh, yeah, and so uh, like I I hope the best for him, but. Uh, I, you know, the Kings were shopping him at the deadline. They'll shop him again this summer and see if they can find him a home where he fits better. Uh, but he's a good teammate. Uh, he did mention yesterday on, on the Twitter box that he might shave off the locks. So we don't know what we're going to see when we, oh, wow. uh, when we see him come out uh, <laughs> on <laughs> at practice today or, or uh, during the game on, on Thursday. Well, that should be a fun surprise, but to wrap this all up, uh james uh thank you for coming on for the show what do you think what is your final score prediction for this game hmm um i'm gonna go 134 130 wow we're going hey, for a high me? scoring affair we're going for- <laughs> no that's a regular scoring affair for the sacramento wow. kings for the king Again, for the knicks that's, that's that's high that's like oh we need to go ot for that type of stuff yeah, no, I mean this. Uh, the Kings have scored 130 uh, like so many times this season. I, it's in the 20s, uh, wow. but uh, but over their last 12 games, they're averaging 130.4 and they're giving up 126.2 or something. Yeah, burn yeah. burners. All it's it's a fun brand of basketball, and Mike Brown it just kills him. It just it just kills his soul <laughs> every Good time. He, he doesn't even want to talk about it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go with 124, 120 Knicks, because we're going to get some defense in here from the Knicks. That's my final score prediction. But James, thank you so much for coming on and previewing this game with me. Please let our listeners know where they can find you if you have any work that's uh, up and coming. Yeah, yeah. You can find me at thekingsbeat.com. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's on Beehive. It's basically a newsletter. 
but I've been writing there for the last year and a half. Uh, you can find me on ESPN 1320 in Sacramento. Uh, and that's, I love radio. Radio is a lot of fun. Um, and on top of that, you can find us on YouTube, the Kings beat. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter where I do a ton of work, uh, which is at James underscore ham NBA. Awesome. Once again, thank you to James for, James for coming on our show and previewing this Knicks versus Kings matchup. To all of our to Knicks Nation out there, thank you once again for tuning in. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to YouTube if you haven't done so already and share all these videos to all your family members, friends, cats, dogs, doesn't matter. Make sure to, to help us continue to grow. We just hit 60K on the YouTube channel. We're trying to aim for 75K and then 100K after that. So make sure to help us achieve our goals and then last and certainly not least please make sure to check out knicksfantv.com we got remy's recaps after every game he details every single game every single player on how they performed and if you can't find this if you don't listen to us on youtube you can also find us on all audio listening platforms apple spotify you name it we're all over the place all right Knicks nation we'll catch you later we out